Well, welcome to Chicago, everyone. I've, in fact, uh, I, I'm coming to you from sunny Tampa, Florida, and uh, just happy to be here. And uh, I get my role is very, very interesting. You know, so far you've got a lot of good, high-level coverage of reliability. I'm going to go a little deeper. Uh, I'm not going to hopefully drown anybody. <clears throat> I'm sure I won't. Based on the on the titles that I saw from those who were signing up, we're not going to be drowning anybody. Okay. But, uh, but I get to go a little bit more into motors. Anyone have motors here? All right. They still make the world turn, as I think. And so, you know, there's some AC and there's some DC motors and there's a variety of motors that are out there. We're gonna try to cover, you know, some basics of it. Make sure you guys are, are comfortable with that as we get through it. Um, it it's interesting, things have changed over, the, over time. In fact, um, this is just a little bit about what we do. PDMA, we manufacture a variety of test equipment, and, and a lot of the case studies and stuff I'm going to be showing you today have a little bit to do with <clears throat> some of the technology that we use. And a lot of what, what our end users are doing is they cross-pollinate a lot of technologies, a lot of what's here today, from thermography to ultrasonics to motor testing. It's a lot of multitasking and multitesting, but, but it's, um, motors have changed a lot. My history comes from the U.S. Navy, okay, so I was on a submarine. Any submariners here? All right, we'll have to talk later. You'll hear a lot of sea stories. Don't tell these guys the definition of sea stories, but, but uh, so I'm gonna tell a few sea stories while I'm at here today. Uh, but they're all real, they're all absolutely valid. Uh, they do change from day to day, but, but there's good sea stories. But anyway, um, in, in, on a submarine, there's a lot of AC induction, uh, you know, some motor generators some, and some DC, right? And I thought I knew a lot about motors, and then I got out of the Navy and was introduced to a world of, oh my goodness, right? Motors that are half the size of this room, and um, you know, the largest DC motor I've tested was 8,000 horse in the steel industry. That's a 12-foot diameter commutator. It's unbelievable. And uh, some very large ABB motors that are coming out at 100 plus thousand horsepower. You know, but don't worry, they have a little 40,000 horsepower motor to get them started. Right? So you guys have a variety, and, and, and those motors, however critical, I'm sure, and these are like you know, wind, wind tunnels and stuff like that, uh, the, uh, NASA owns a lot of those big motors. And, and, but, but you can have a one horsepower motor that's just as critical in terms of the cost if it goes down. Right? Now, it doesn't cost you, a, you know, a, a, a tens of thousands of dollars to ship it across town to get it re, re, rewound but it could cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars in downtime. So, you know, when, when a lot of times we get asked, well, how, how, how small of a motor should you apply the testing equipment to? It's not based on size. It's, it's purely on finances. And I know I'm, talking, I'm speaking to the choir here. So let's just review finances a little bit. If, if finances is not your drive for reliability, then, then, then probably you're in the wrong business, okay? And I know I'm, again, based on the titles of people who are here, Obviously, I'm speaking to the choir, okay? We've got everyone from analysts, but a lot of supervisory roles and stuff like that, where finances is a large part of what you do. And so in terms of what we look for is, is reduction in expected, you know, in, in, in downtime, increased productivity. Um, uh, I think uh, Rudy mentioned something, or was it Alan, something about efficiency. If you could get, you know, 1% of, of Sanjay's, you know, electric bill, man, I'd like to pocket that, a million bucks, right? That's a huge deal. Can I tell you, years ago, we spent a lot of time building an energy analysis module. Why did we do that? Because everyone was pushing us to do that. You know, and this was back when, they were, when the government was forcing, hey, every motor has to be around to a certain efficiency standard and motor repair shops were being stressed to, to build efficiency test equipment, you know, to support that standard. And so we built an energy analysis module which compared, hey, a brand new motor versus a repair motor. And then there's a balance there. A lot of you guys argued with amongst yourselves, is should I repair or replace? Right? And it's, a lot of times it's just based on cost of repair versus cost of replace. We built a module to say how much time would it take to actually save money beyond the cost of, repair, of replacement by just going higher efficiency or, or the cost of repair by a higher efficiency motors. About that time, the government backed off and all of a sudden all the push pressure on the re rewind shops disappeared. I don't know who lobbied, but they did a good job. And so that's out there, it's available, but people aren't quite as interested in efficiency. A lot of it because even our own report said it's gonna take three plus years on most re re replacement efficiencies to cover the cost of repair, right? So in other words, you could get it repaired for a cost less, you know, than it, obviously than it took to, re to replace a motor. Repair is always less expensive than replace, but, but if, if we could verify a return on investment in less than two years, then they would buy a new motor. But if it was more than two years, now the bean counters want that money now, right? So I, I shouldn't call them bean counters. There's probably some accountants in here today, right? But the point being is that, that efficiency is important, but how do you guys as reliability say, hey, you know, 
we always do say reliability before efficiency, and I think that still goes, right? Because you can have a, a high efficiency motor as much as you want. If it fails as a result of a cable or like Rudy mentioned, a, a bus bar falling off as a bad connection, efficiency doesn't do you any good, all right? So, but I don't want to dismiss energy cost analysis because it's the single highest percent of your ownership uh, on electric motors, okay? So speaking more of money, this is just an example of, of, of our own customers, PDMA technology customers, and all the, cl the client or the, the hosts here today. The, the, the technologies here today have their own return on investment, okay? But this, if your industry fits one of these, that's great. Uh, we're talking numbers, you know, on average, 11% reduction in downtime and a four month return on investment. Now, why do I show you this? Not because, well, I mean, it's great that you take these numbers back and you can justify equipment and that's all great, right? But that word justification is a big deal, okay? And some of you guys could have a tendency to, hey, my plan is running perfect, it's good to go, and, and become comfortable, and then they change management, right? And all of a sudden, they're asking, what have you guys done for me lately? Do you have numbers? Again, I'm, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir, but justification, justification is a big deal, okay? Uh, if you're not sending an email report around to the leadership of the company showing what you've done, showing the, the, the cost improvements, uh, you're probably looking at, uh, you know, a five to 10 year cycle and we've seen it. I've been around long enough that uh, companies that were at the top of the game, I'm talking like world-class maintenance standards, and then you visit them five years later, everybody's gone, technology's in the shelf, you know, they just don't, it just, it's gone. And, and why does that happen? Because we're not justifying what we're doing. And okay, you have to have those records. New management comes in, they want to make a, make a mark for themselves. If they, they, they don't want to kill a program that has proven itself to work through documentation. So make sure you're doing that. All right, let's stick with money, shall we? Who bets on horses? All right, have you ever have you ever had a trifecta? No, I know. Well, what is a trifecta, right? First of all, a trifecta is picking the one, two, three finishers in a row, and and there's a lot of money in that. Okay, I think a two dollar bet has pulled somebody a hundred and thirty thousand dollars. That's pretty good return, ain't it? If you can pick the top three finishers at the Kentucky Derby. One, two, three, it was a $130,000 payoff for a $2 bet. Now, why do I talk about that motor reliability? Well, I'm here to tell you that if you apply the technologies that you just justified and spent all that money on, thermography technology, motor testing technology, vibration, ultrasonics, you name it, it's out there, right? You spend all that money, how do you apply it? And so I'm gonna challenge you to make sure that you're applying that in a trifecta mode in, in, in all three areas. Because I'm telling you, so often we walk into plants and they're great at troubleshooting. And troubleshooting is exciting, right? I mean, that's, for the analysts and technicians out there, it's the best, right? Troubleshooting is, is what we go to school for. It's what we live for. You go celebrate the win and it's Miller time or whatever, wherever the local manufacturer is, right? So that's all very good, except for it's not the most effective way of being productive. And it doesn't make the, for the stockholders, it doesn't do them much good, right? So I'm not saying you shouldn't be good at it and we'll continue to challenge you for that. But there are a few other areas that are involved. Specifically, let's start with quality control. So in terms of quality control, uh, who warehouses their own motors? Wow, that's impressive. Who outsources warehousing? Who has no spare motors at all? So not a lot of willingness to provide me some feedback, but that's okay, because I'm gonna tell you this. It, that wasn't a trick question, but the next one might be, okay? So, so quality control is a big deal, and, and when I say that, it's, it's, I like to say, where does it start? Okay, and, and I can tell you that, that we sell technology all over the world. And, and guess who the number one largest buyer of our technology is from year to year? Any guesses? Motor shops, you know, service centers, right? People who go out and do the testing. You know, a lot of people are gonna buy the technology, but a lot of people just want a professional to come in and do the testing, right? And more importantly, they want to have that you know, quality control testing done at the motor repair level. Now, it doesn't necessarily take PDMA technology to do that, right? Motor shops have a variety of, of technology that they have, and, and they, can, they can offer you that technology or they cannot, right? The question is, have you looked at your quality control standards of motor repair lately? Most people haven't. And if you haven't stepped foot into the motor repair shop that does your repairs about you know, four times a year, you're not doing yourself a favor, okay? They need to see you. I'm not saying they need to see you so often they have your name on a wall, but you know, that, that may be problematic, but, but they need to see you and you need to revi you know, revisit those quality control standards. And I'm sure many of you do. 
Um, benchmarking is very popular. If you don't feel like you have a good quality control standard with your motors, a lot of those, those repair shops have quality control engineers that would be happy to sit down with you in a nice office and review what you're paying for. Okay, and you can say, well, why don't we have this or why don't we have that? And rather than relying on a paper report, you can have digital reports sent to you that you can incorporate right into your own databases at your shop and follow that. So quality control really starts at the beginning. Okay, and, uh, and we want to walk through that a little bit. Like, for instance, here's a guy in a, in a motor repair shop, and, and this is the, the repair shop himself testing the motor for you. Okay, uh, that, that's big, a big deal. And I know, again, I feel like I'm speaking to the choir based on the titles, but uh, that, that's a good place to start at the repair. I mentioned warehousing. If your warehouse doesn't look like that, where the motors are off the floor, wrapped, being rotated, being tested. You know, we do a tip of the week, which, which we send out to all people who visit our website. And it's just, it's just guidelines to, to, to think about in terms of motor reliability. We did like a four part series on, on, on warehousing. Now, can I tell you, if that's not what your warehouse looks like, you probably ought to be outsourcing that, okay? There's a bunch of people, a lot of motor repair shops have warehouses specifically designed to store your motors and deliver them on demand based on when you need them. So that's a serious consideration. Uh, I, I kind of stuck my foot in my mouth. I was going through a, a steel mill, and I asked, why are you putting all your failed motors over here? Why are you storing them? And they said, those aren't failed. Those are our spares. And, and they're not covered. They're, not, they're just sitting around. They're covered with dust. And, and, but they were close proximity to the application, so they could get them replaced really fast. Well, I'm not sure how long they're going to last, right? We got to visit a, a, a facility that built engine block, engine heads, right? What's interesting is it wasn't, they didn't just build it for Ford or Chrysler. They built it for all of them. There was like four different manufacturers that came out of the same facility, which I kind of thought that was interesting. And they all had their own quality control lines, right? Well, they used a lot of servo motors, okay? As you can imagine, robotics and stuff like that. Um, one out of every three spare servo motors we tested had problems. Okay, and they were wondering why they were having such a bad productivity run. Okay, so your warehouse needs to be filled with very good pre-qualified motors. Uh, now, I always tell people that if you don't have this good of a quality control, let the new guy start the motor when it goes in. Okay, that's just a good, good you know, thing to think about. That new guy can take the blame a lot better. So, quality control doesn't just stop at the warehouse. Okay, you've got it on manufacturing and repair. You've got it in the warehouse storage. But when you install that motor, that's a big deal, okay, a very big deal. You want to have, you want to have people on site. Uh, you know, we, I think i show you a case study later where, where a motor about this size was dropped on a ship. Well, that's not good, right, if it's not blocked properly. And even if it's blocked properly, if it drops far enough, you're going to damage it. It ended up affecting the cooling. And this, and this motor burned up as a result of cooling damages, you know, cooling flow damages on the, on the air slot. But bottom line is be there, make sure it's installed properly, make sure that the testing of not just the motor, and we're going to cover it through, through, the, through the next five or six hours, but, uh, you know, make sure that the power quality, as was mentioned in the earlier session, make sure the power circuit, everything, you know, going to that motor is good. If you can start that motor healthy, the life expectancy is, is maybe by design. Right? Generally, motors, I was sitting through an IEEE conference, and the, the speaker was saying, hey, motors are designed for 20 years. How many people get 20 years out of their motors? Not very often these days. Some of them, I mean, it happens, right? And the more reliability effort you put into it, the more likely you'll get the life expectancy out of that motor. It's just not often the case. All right, so quality control number one. That's one of the areas you want, and, and I tell you what, it's the easiest to start in, too, because you've got this nice air conditioning MCC to go put somebody in there and just, I want to know what I got in there. Are they good? Are they not? And if they're not, get them out, right? Next is trending. Uh, we like to say trend is your friend. It's the most boring part of reliability. You know, you're going out, you're collecting data because guess what? If you set into our technical support department and someone sends us data to look at to help them troubleshoot a motor, guess how many data points we usually get? One. After something went bump in the middle of the night, someone takes a test, and we get to help them analyze it. That's great. I mean, we, it's still something. The beauty of the electrical industry, a little bit, and I think it's a slight advantage over some of the mechanical side of uh, the reliability. How many mechanical types do we have in here? There's always a few. We're still going to be nice to you guys. Don't worry. But, uh, but you know, it, what, what I like to say is that, that there's a lot of IEEE NEMA standards that really establish sort of an acceptance criteria for certain values that you can test electrically. That's not always the case mechanically, right? The vibration industry's been around a long time, though, and so they got a real good handle on, on, their, on their levels. And so I like to tell you, even if without historical trending, which makes our life so much easier, makes your life so much easier in troubleshooting, 
it, it, we, can, we can compare to a lot of standards to try to do some, some good for you. But I can tell you, if you look at your database someday and you, don't, you, have, you have no data on some of your critical assets, man, you got to get some data. It's going to make you so much better in terms of the next stage. But trending can occur in, in a variety of areas. I think this is sort of like Rudy, uh, partial PPE, right? That's kind of an example where he was in earlier. Uh, there's other forms of PPE that if you haven't been in the canary suit, it's good to get in every once in a while and know the pains of that, right? And uh, today, today, of course, uh, Rudy mentioned MTAPs and, and test access panels and windows. And, and a lot of the, 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 the safety standards today are, are kind of preventing you from opening cabinets. D don't worry about that. There's, there's alternatives to that, and you're seeing it here, right? So, you know, rather than, rather than the canary suit, you can jump into the, you know, regular clothes and just get a lot of things done. I think we got a brochure back there that says you can test 100 motors in a day. Well, only if you're doing this, right? I mean, you can go from motor to motor to motor. You're not putting up the safety net and everything like that. And it turns to be a one-person job. But training's a big deal. And, and now we move from training to the final of the trifecta, which is troubleshooting. Everything has an end. My challenge to you as leaders in the reliability industry is what do you have in place, actions, to, to, a, to attack a situation where you have trouble? You know, when things are going good, it's all good, right? I remember hearing a, 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 one person mentioned that, that in terms of advertising. When things are good, you should advertise. When things are bad, you have to advertise, right? Well, reliability is the same. You know, when things are good, you should trend. When things are bad, you have to get in there and troubleshoot, right? And so the point being is, you know, what do you have for your new technician or new analyst to get involved, right? Because your lead guy, we call him the guru, he just went down to sunny Tampa, Florida to get trained on an MC Emacs technology. So he's, he's not at the beach. He's actually working. I just want you guys to know that there's actually work going on down there. And, and so, uh, you know, when he's down there doing training and he turns his phone off, what do you guys have in place as, a, as an immediate action to tackle a, a critical asset going down? You know, are you ready for that? It's a good challenge to go back and think, hey, if we lost the main motor that makes our, us money, what does the brand new guy do with it? What, even if it's as simple as trying to isolate the problem so that they can finally contact the guy down at the beach, or I mean in the office of PDMA, and find out, hey, this is what we got. What do you think we should do next? Right? In the Navy, we call those casualty procedures. Okay? And I guess if you're 1,000 feet underwater, it, things become real important. You've got to get back to the surface. right? I mean, it's kind of it, it, you're elevated a little bit. So they spend a lot of time on casualty procedures, no matter who you were. If you weren't sure what to do when the main motor went down, grab CP1, grab CP2. Let's go take some action, and you can get it done. So challenge your reliability group. Hey, I want to know, do we have immediate actions for new guys to take when we lose our motor? And it's just a good challenge. And that pretty much wraps up that trifecta. Okay? So, so if you look at your, you know, let's so say you've got infrared technology, motor technology, you've got vibration, ultrasonics, whatever you've got, are they being applied in all three. Obviously, they're going to be implied in troubleshooting. That's the easy one, right? You always break out equipment when things are going bump in the middle of the night. And they usually go bump on Friday night or Saturday and bring you out of the, they keep you out of church sometimes. That's, that's not a good thing. But so, so, you know, make sure you're applying it in all those three areas, okay? So let's get into a little bit more fun stuff, right? That's, that's a big 30,000 foot view. Let's dive down a little bit. What, what do you think the, the biggest killer of motors is? What stresses are, does a motor in, in, in heat? And you are absolutely right. Uh, of the stresses, heat is the number one killer. Almost everything I relate you, you to today, as far as reliability concerns, is going to come back to heat, uh, which is kind of important if you're from Florida. This, Epson is putting out some nice heat up here. But, but motors don't do well with excessive heat, right? But can I tell you something that's interesting? You know, if I go back 30 years ago, that ages me just a little bit, I know, but, and I put my hand on a standard NEMA AC induction motor, how long do you think I could put my hand on that? Three seconds. Today, almost not at all, right? But back 30 years ago, so you, could, you could hang on there a little bit, right? But it's changed entirely, right? Now you put your hand, just like Mike said, you put your hand on a motor today, if you're not ready for that, it's going to burn you. And you're going to think, oh my gosh, there's something going on in that motor, break out the thermal camera, right? We're going to show you a case study on it. They just are so much hotter today. Why? I can tell you something else. If I took a 50 horsepower motor 100 years ago and put it on this table, it might collapse the table, right? Uh, there are 50 horsepower motors out today that Sanjay might be able to wrestle with. That's still a pretty big motor, but but the point being is they ha they have really shrunk. But yet they're getting good horsepower out of that. Have you ever have you have you looked at Ford lately? They got a six cylinder motor that's pulling more horsepower than the eight cylinder. It's a weird analogy, but but it's interesting. 
And it's the same with motors. They've really downsized the steel, the, the manufacturing element of the motors, and all that heat is quickly relegated or, or elevated to the surface and expanded out into the environment. They've gotten better at removing heat. Now, sea story, all right? When I first joined PDMA out of the, out of the Navy, they sent me to a, a phosphate industry to do some testing and some baselining for a company. So I'm walking through, and I just can't find this motor. I mean, I'm looking all over. There, I'm, I'm build, side of the building. I, it's, I know it's in this building. So I go back to the supervisor. I say, listen, I cannot find this dryer motor. He says, oh, you walk right past it. I'm sure he walks me back and says, oh, it's right there. It's under that mound of phosphate, right? So I go, oh, OK, well, that, that makes a lot of sense. Now, he said, but don't worry. It's a totally enclosed fan-cooled motor. <laughs> All right, that brings us back to the heat element, right? Uh, it's, it's like, yeah, OK, yeah, there's none of that phosphate's getting into the motor, but none of the heat's leaving, right? So imagine what that motor was experiencing. So I had to you know, scrape away the phosphate just to get my accelerometer on this thing. Okay, that, that's the mentality of, of so we, we've got to overcome that. A lot of stresses, and that's that environmental thing. You know, that is a big deal, okay? Don't dismiss that. So here's a motor in question. Anybody have own DC motors? All right, Mike, you're perfect. This motor is 125 horse, not a monster, not like the 8,000 like, not, not like eight horsepower motor I was talking about, but it's critical. And guess what? The, the, the blower is undersized, okay? Now, that's an engineering issue, right? We talk about engineering reliability. Uh, again, I don't know how, how someone would know that up front unless the manufacturer helped them out. But, but what does help them out is to find out by doing a little bit of testing that there's a problem, okay? And this is the equivalent of having, you know, if you look at 150 degrees on the motor to the left versus 106 degrees on a, sta on a steady state load, both running the same load, okay, that's a big deal, okay? You know, one has the big fan and one has the little, little bitty fan, right? And it's a problem, okay? Now, how big of a problem? Well, picture's worth a thousand words as soon as I show you some numbers. Quantitative first, right? I couldn't let you out of here without some quantitative. I do have a picture to show you on this. So, so what we're trying to focus on here is, 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 and I know you guys can't read that. I'm just gonna read some numbers. Okay, we got like a 300 millihenry reading on, on the motor with red, and red is bad. If you remember nothing else from today, just remember red is bad, okay? I get in trouble for that every once in a while because some numbers will change based on temperature environment and they turn red as an alert, but it doesn't mean they're bad. But I want you guys to think today red is bad, okay? So the bad motor here, that 125 horsepower, has about a 300 and some millihenry reading, but the other good ones are up around 3,000. Now, millihenry is basically the, it's the inductance characteristics. It's, it's, it's how the windings create a magnetic field, if you want to look at it that way, okay? Now, that is an obvious problem, okay? We've lost a lot of turns in this DC field, okay? And that's what we're focusing on is the field section, not the armature, but the field. We've lost a ton of turns in this thing, and it's a big problem, all right? Here's another problem. How many of you guys use megers, megometers? Megers is a trademark. All right, everybody uses these. Back when I first started, it was this type. You remember that one? You're too young for that. You guys probably push the buttons, right? Do you really? All right, well, then maybe I'm younger than I think. So, but, but that was a big deal, and that was sort of like the go-to, right? You send the technician out, megers the motor, comes back and says, the motor's fine, must be the pump, right? It's always a good for the mechanical guys. We always blame the pump for everything, right? So that being said, guess what they would have saw on the good motor and the bad motor? Are the, either one of those readings going to alert that's 11,000 meg ohms or 10 and 11 gig ohms of insulation? Who's going to start that motor based on that number? If that's the only thing we're basing it on, I'm starting that motor. But that's a problem, right? Because in this situation, we're just burning stuff up. Right? I mean, you can see the insulation's practically gone. Now, one thing that's nice about DC motors is a lot of times the system is floating. At least the armature circuit's floating, which means you can have a dead ground on an armature. You can still start that motor, and it'll run until you get two grounds, right? Once that second ground, then you get the little light show, and then you figure out where the problem is. See, story time, I was at a paper mill, right? Speaking of grounds. And, and we go in, and I'm testing with and I say, hey, you got like two volts on phase two. And it's an ungrounded distribution system. Not that we have to all know what that is, but basically there's, there's no four-wire ground. That means I mean, they can run with a pure ground. I said, you only got two volts on phase two. Your system is grounded. And their answer was, yeah, we know. We're just waiting for the fireball. So when a second phase develops a ground, it blows up, right? There's a lot of current. Something 
turns, catches on fire. And then they go fix the source, right? That, that's one way we call that, you know, it's one method of troubleshooting. Uh, we like to call that Easter egg in a little bit. Just let, wait till something shows up. But this is, this is, you know, 155 degree temperature insulation. We're getting all over that. You can see the damage that's occurring from that, right? Now, doing a little more testing than the Megger, which is a great tool. It's built into our system. Right? We even do that testing, but it's not the end of the day. It's not the end of the game. It's not the total picture. You guys have to be you know, more aware of what else has to be applied to make sure you're not doing this to your, critical, to your critical assets. All right, so it all comes down to fault zones. When I started, came out of the Navy, I looked all of about 18 years old. I still kind of look almost 18 today. Not really. But, but so one thing I did not have is credibility. That word credibility is a big issue, right? So what is credibility? You know, as you get mortgages and, and spouses and children and, and all this stuff, you get a lot of credibility. Your hair goes away and you, your skin changes, your wrinkles. I look around here and there's a lot of credibility in this room. No, I'm just teasing. So, but without that, what do you use to, to emphasize what you're troubleshooting or what you're involved in, right? We like to call this the, 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 tr the, the, the motor, electric motor troubleshooting protocol or communication protocol, something that, you know, a standard language that you guys within your plant can use to make sure that everyone's talking the same thing, all right? Without that, it's the pump versus it's the motor, right? And can I tell you, 20 years ago, pump versus motor was a very common conversation, even in our tech support. We were looking at vibration and, and motor test data and trying to figure out, is it the pump or the motor? But you guys have that figured out pretty well today. You really do. Today, is, is it the motor or is it the variable frequency drive, right? Motor or drive, that's the big conversation today. So if you can figure that out, you've, you've really come a long way, especially in troubleshooting. Anyone ever have a nuisance trip? We all have nuisance trips. Where, where is, what is the source? How do you get to the bottom of that? And a lot of that comes down to what we're going to be looking at here is the fault zone protocol. So because uh, another C story, I know I got a lot of C stories, but so we're out doing a, some testing for Corvettes, right? The, 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 uh, the, the, the electronic harnesses and stuff. And they sent us to Texas to troubleshoot a refinery motor. This refinery motor was supposed to be 2,000 horsepower. Someone missed a zero. It was a 20,000 horsepower synchronous motor, right? Costing someone $1,000 a minute downtime. That means every time I use the bathroom, I just cost somebody $5,000. That's a lot of stress, right? So we show up with motor test equipment, vibration, thermography. We have it all, right? We're going to save the day. And as I'm coming up to meet 10 people that are meeting us, that's how critical this motor is, they're looking at me like, are, are, you, are you the equipment holder? Where's the, you know, where, who's actually going to analyze this motor? Because I looked 18 years old, right? But I knew a lot about technology at that point. So what I had to do, I had to come up with a communication protocol, some type of language that I could easily communicate to them what we were going to be looking at. You guys should have that same language. So when the technician comes in and says, hey, we think it's the motor, it doesn't stop there. But a lot of times that's where it is. Hey, it's not the motor, it's got to be the driver, it's got to be the pump. I talked to a company the other day and they said, this is our troubleshooting technique. When something stops working, we replace the drive, flat out. I said, like, why do you start with the drive? Any guesses? Because it's the easiest thing to replace, right? Disconnect, reconnect, start it up, see what happens. What do they, where do they go next? They go to the motor. Why? Because it's easier than, than, the, than the cable run. They've broken it up into three sections. It's the drive, it's the cable run, and it's the motor. And that's the sequence they go in. The cable run's the hardest. They said, sadly, it usually ends up being the cable run, right? That's Easter egging, right? We don't want you to do that. I want to break this motor into sections that are very easy. Now, this, like I think Rudy mentioned earlier, smoke makes this thing go round and round, and our goal is to keep the smoke in, right? And so we're going to break it into six equal components. Any one of these fault zones can take your motor out. I just want you guys to talk about these when you're talking about troubleshooting. And they are as follows. Power quality, what, you, what a motor eats, right? Power circuit insulation, stator, rotor, and air gap. So if, if nothing else, go back with this, with this language, this standard language of motor troubleshooting, and, 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 and start talking about these things. Some of them are more likely to kill you than others, okay, as far as the motor being, going, going away. But, there, but any one of those can be a problematic. And as long as you're looking at them, you should be in pretty good shape. Let's break them down just a little bit. Um, well, before I, let me, let me just break them out here, actually. From a power quality perspective, uh, how many, see if you guys can finish my sentence. And your mom used to tell you this all the time. You are what you, okay. No, I never miss that. Everybody always has that in their mind. So that's why I always ask it, because it's a great answer. Power quality is what a motor eats. 
Okay? I think it was covered a little bit in an earlier two sections, but if that power quality is not ideal at least, or at least close, your motor's not going to run as well. Okay? And there's a lot of things we can show you that can go wrong with power quality to make a difference. Power circuit. Okay? You can have perfect power quality coming out of a transformer that SD Myers just, just tested for you. It can be a perfect transformer. But if that's going through a defective power circuit, what is your motor seeing? Not a perfect system, right? So we got to make sure that power circuit is, is, is in good shape and a variety of ways to look at that. Next is power, is I'm going to say insulation. Okay, once that current goes, is heading through the motor, it's supposed to go to the windings and create magnetic fields, right? But what if the insulation is like that DC motor I showed you? That's a path to ground, right? If current's going to ground, it's not going to your motor, and that's not good, all right? So that's a pretty straightforward one. Now, what's interesting is the insulation between the stator fault zone, between these turns on the stator, it's the same insulation to ground, but it's looked at very differently. Remember that same DC motor that was good on ground? So it would have passed this fault zone, but it failed miserably on the turns fault zone, right? Different insulation, same insulation, different measuring techniques, okay? So it's important to segregate those two and understand that, hey, a mega test is not the end of the day, all right? Great test, though. Love it. Let's go to the air gap, because that's probably the next place where electrons go as they jump the air gap. Sort of, magnetically, all right? We'll just say magnetically, all right? So that air gap, if I take it back and look at motors 100 years ago, I could stick my hand in the air gap. Guess how thin that air gap is today? You can't even really see through it, okay? Precision alignment, precision balance, these things are important. If you're not asking your motor shop what it costs for you to get those things, start asking, okay? Because they don't have to give you precision if you don't pay for it. But I'm telling you, for any of your critical assets, precision alignment, precision and balance, beyond what the minimum standards are, is worth every penny you pay. And finally, rotor. It's actually one of the more exciting elements. I like the rotor because it's moving, okay? It's tangible, it's something that, that thing's moving. And guess what IEEE EPRI studies, uh, and I, well, actually both of them, actually. I, I tend to go more on the, on the EPRI study, uh, which is the actual e Electric Power Research Institute, differently than the Alliance, right? But they paid GE to do a big study on, on hundreds and hundreds, maybe even, th I think, thousands of motors. And rotors were blamed on 10% of the faults. We can't ignore rotors. Rotors seem like this big piece of steel that go roundy roundy and everything's good, but there's a variety of different motor designs and hopefully we can spell out a few of those today. So let's apply the trifecta into some of these fault zones. All right. Imagine, it, put yourself in these situations and say, okay, what would I do? You just send a motor in for repair. All right. And the local, uh, what's your, what motor shop did you use for your motor repair? Let's just say Joliet Electric. Joliet Electric. All right. So Joliet Electric tests this motor. Now, you're hoping that they're, they're testing it with, you know, with technology, and I, I guarantee they have technology. They have uh, digital low resistance zone meters and surge tests and, and high pot tests. They have a variety of technology in shops to do the testing they need. Well, they may also have the MC Max, which is the one we manufacture. And in this situation, we have some interesting data. Too far away for you to see, but the resistive imbalance is 22%. That means so, so, so the, 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 ideally, the shop is applying technology some type of low resistance ohm meter, and they're saying, hey, it's 22%. Unacceptable. I mean, not even close to acceptable, all right? So they're smart enough to know not to send this motor to you. So Joliet's saying, hey, we got to do something about it. Not maybe always the right thing, but in this situation, they put it back in the oven. You can see it heated from 22 the day before to 48 degrees the next day. They put it in the heater, heated it up, make sure all the moisture is gone again, and it came out the next day and was measuring 7%. Do you want that motor? with the 7% resistive imbalance is much better than 22. No, you don't. Why? Because it's red, and red is excellent, excellent. All right, so nice to have these standards, all right, these, these limits that you're going to accept your motors at. Shops have the same limits for the motors that they're rewinding. Well, they decided they're going to have to take this thing, take it apart, take a look, and they did. And thank goodness that they did. So you guys can probably see this, right? That's where they're putting, you know, coils together. They're supposed to be soldered. It just didn't get done. I always say it was probably Friday or maybe a Monday. You never know, right? But either way, a simple test, simple applying quality control, okay, was able to identify a stator-related anomaly. And how long is this motor going to run? It's hard to say. It's a form-wound coil. I can tell you that there's no, there's no, there's no turn-to-turn fault, no turn-to-turn short. But that will start arcing immediately, okay? And you don't always get a chance to put a thermal camera inside there, right? So, so we got to be able to see that in advance, get it out of the way, 
right? A lot of reliability testing is just identifying conditions conducive to failure and getting rid of those conditions, right? So that the motor lasts the, as long as it's supposed to, okay? Simple quality control. It's a great case study, though. Let's move from quality control to trending, okay? Put yourself in another situation. Again, trend, near, trend is your friend, even though it's not very exciting, right? Somebody's got it. You remember the Dunkin' Donuts commercial? It's time to make the donuts. The guy was dressed up like a lady, had a mustache. Anyway, I always think of that commercial. It's time to do the testing. Now, a lot of the vendors out there are trying to do things to make it life easier on you guys, to allow you to do more analysis and less testing, like permanently installed solutions. Who, who's using permanently installed reliability technology today? Okay, we got nowhere but up to go, right? So as you start to, to want more analysis done and less physical testing, permanently installed solutions for your critical assets and stuff are gonna become something to look at. So let's look at this motor, 4160, two pole scourge of the earth, right? Whether you're doing vibration testing, motor testing, current signature, it doesn't matter. Two-pole motors are the most difficult to analyze. Why? Because they're so close to line frequency. They're, they're, they're run, they're, their frequencies get intertwined with, with electrical frequencies. And just it, it, you don't have to be a, a vibration expert or a current signature analysis expert to know. But two-pole motors are just tough, OK? High torque, high RPM. A lot of things can go wrong. Anything faster is more dangerous, right? And so there's just a lot of things involved with that. How many of you guys know all the number of bars and slots on your motors today? I didn't expect any hands, but you will in a few years. Why? Because you came to this presentation, right? Now, every motor you get fixed, worked on, whatever, that's going to be part of your request. I want to know the number of bars and the number of SATER slots because it helps your analysts be better at what they do, right? Develop this library and, and knowledge on your motors, all right? So, trend is your friend from 2008 to 2011. Okay, and, and let me just tell you a little bit what you're looking at. Okay, this is a, 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 a spectrum of current, okay, and we're really focusing in on the pole pass frequency. What is the pole pass frequency? Well, in an AC induction motor, you have a, a magnetic field going roundy roundy in the stator, right? Pretty standard, right? Now, in an induction motor, is the rotor going faster or slower? It has to be slower, or there's no induction, right? We have to have a differential, right? Try that on one hand or on one foot. Right? I had to work on this a long time to get these two different speeds. Right? So, so every time these fields, rotor fields and stator fields, are being passed, I'm simplifying it for those. Any electrical engineers in here? All right, just ignore some of this stuff. I, it's just, you know, but as these two fields pass, we're getting a modulation. Okay? That modulation, guess what? Shows up really nice on a spectrum. Okay, C story. <laughs> I was in charge of the Emacs project for the company, and, we, and I was out in the East Coast doing some testing on a utility plant. And the first thing they threw me on to test, and I, again, I'm just beta testing the product. I want to make sure it's going to work. It's doing power testing, current signature, all that. I hook up to a pulverizer motor. Any utilities in here? Okay, pulverizer motors, they crush coal and they send it into the boiler for, for heat, right? I see a big old whopping pole pass sideband. It's a rotor bar problem. That's what in the industry, a high pole pass means rotor bars, right? At least that's as much as we thought. And I was like, living right, I found a rotor bar problem. What a great technology, right? We're going to sell a million of these things. So he gets me on another pulverizer motor. Guess what I saw on the second one? Same exact pole pass. Way up there, two for two, living right. It's a great day. And after all four said the same thing, I kind of started to question it, right? Wah, wah, wah. All that excitement kind of goes away. And, and, and sure enough, the, the whole pulverizer element, the rotation element was turning at pole pass. Mechanical elements moving at pole pass, guess what? They show up in electrical because they create a torsional load, and it can absolutely look like a rotor defect. Moving on, let's strip out that line frequency and look at a demodulated current, OK? This is just another way of, of trying to see not, you know, a little bit smaller signals, almost like going from linear to logarithmic. You can see some of the stuff in the dirt comes up out, and you can see better things. Either way, all thumbs up. From 2008 to 2011, everything's looking good. Trend is your friend. We can make a lot of quick decisions on trend. I mean, really fast. Look just like it did last year. Wasn't a problem last year. Look someplace else. Must be the pump. So in January, though, 2012, pull pass elevates, gets into the caution level. These levels are established by industry people for years and years. Okay, About 45 dB down from the line frequency. If you subtract this one from this one, anything lower than 45 starts to be questionable. All right? That's on the test for lunch, by the way. All right, let's look at the DMOD. Before it was 0.1, less than 0.1, something like now it's 7. 
right? Or 0.7, I'm sorry, I got a little bit excited there. It's 0.7, it went from 0.1 to 0.7. Either way, it's a 25 time increase. That's a big deal. If, if we didn't have a trend on this, we may not think it's such a big deal. We may think that's base, okay? That's definitely not base. So, some things to think about when, when you're looking at, at, at potential rotor problems, okay? Because we've got elevated pole pass, elevated, elevated DMOD pole pass, both the same frequency, just looked at in two different tests. We think it might be rotors. Our technical support team wants to see three separate indications that it's a rotor. Changes in vibration, or three separate electrical tests, which are our favorite, of course. Mine being inrush. Inrush startup is my favorite test of all. So I've been around the industry a long time, and if you're only gonna get one piece of equipment electrically, go for the inrush startup, okay? That's a big deal, we can talk about that. But what speed is the motor? You guys remember what this one was? Two pole, 35, 70, that thing's screaming fast. Why is that important for rotor bar integrity? Because the faster you go, the more centrifugal force, and if you've got an open slot, and that thing has really got a break, it wants to come out of that slot, and what does it hit when it comes out of the slot? Stator windings, you just doubled your repair. You either doubled your repair, or you now you got a replacement instead of repair, right? We gotta stop all that stuff, right? So rotor design, is it open or closed, is huge, right? Limit starts and stops. We think we got a rotor problem, operations, can we make that a, a backup motor? Let's not, or keep it steady state, don't be changing loads, all right? And when you start a motor up, that's the most stressful time on a rotor bar's life. I, heard, I read a report when it said a 100-degree deg uh, rise in temperature through startup, which is not that uncommon. You push the start button, cross the line, 100-degree rise in temperature across the rotor bar puts, I think, like nine tons of axial stress on the growth at the, at the end bar, at the, at the shorting ring. Nine tons. Now, why isn't it shooting it out? Well, it only expands so far. But here's why it's a problem. If they're all expanding at nine tons of pressure at the same time, no big deal. But if you have a high-resistance connection in one of your bars, Guess what? The current through it's not the same. It doesn't expand at the same rate. Let's say you got a one ton differential between one bar one and bar two. What's gonna happen? Bar two's gonna break, right? Because it's not expanding at the same rate. Snap. That's why when you, when you send your, rotor to, your motors to the shop, they come back with a rotor defect and they're all right next to each other. Now you know why. It's differential thermal stress. You break one, you break the next one, you break the next one, all happens together, right? That's why. So increased testing frequency, obviously we think there's a problem. Let's test more and get a better trend and then minimize load fluctuations, which is the same as starts and stops, okay? These are just some general guidelines you guys are probably well aware of. Now, who watched Sesame Street as kids? All right, very good, very good. That means you guys are all rounded, all right? Now, one of the songs that they used to sing in Sesame Street was, one of these things is not like the other. Remember that? Motors are the very same way. You guys hopefully have another motor like the first, right? And if you can compare that data, it's as almost as good as trend. It really is, unless they're both problematic, and that, that's a different story. But in this situation, a comparison data, back down under 0.1. So now we know that that 0.7 is meeting something, okay? It's not just a low thing, it's there, right? It's something to be aware of. So, tr you know, next time the guy says, hey, we see this, we think it's a rotor bar problem. You're asking the technician, can you go look at another motor and compare it? Can we just get some comparison data? A great troubleshooting tool. They decided to make the call on just those three things. On pole pass sideband and line frequency, pole pass, side, pole pass amplitude and DMOD testing, and a comparison to another motor. I'm not sure I would have made that call that quick, but they did, and look what they found. Now, why is this specifically one having trouble? Can I tell you something else? You see how this slot here where the rotor bar is going through? is it still looks healthy, there's nothing, it looks normal. If this had been burning for a while, had been open for a while, this slot starts to burn open, all right? Because current finds a way. If it's not able to travel through the rotor bar, it's gonna travel through the iron. It's gonna burn the ends of your laminations up and it's gonna open that slot. Remember the two pole high speed issue? When you start to open that slot open, that bar's coming out. This bar does not need to be restacked or anything because they caught it early enough. But you see this rubbing damage here? I think that's saying something. And I think they, oh, look at that. That's a spider ring, right, or a spider compression. So a rotor consists of all, you know, this is actually a stator, right? This is where the rotor sits inside this. But the stator has all these laminations that are, have to be pressed together. Really thin steel laminations, they have to press them together and keep them tight. That's what these, I call them spider arms or whatever. They push them tight. Well, I think one was sticking up a little bit higher than it should have, and that's why it started hitting the rotor and probably is the reason why it broke and cracked that. And, and, but we can fix that. We can get that fixed, we can get it, it repaired and put it back in service. Great, ca great catch, great early catch. Note to self, that case study got that guy a nice PDMA jacket.
you send a good case study with follow-up to PDMA, you're going to get a jacket. And what's one of these winter jackets? You know, this is for winter. It's Florida. That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't own the. I don't have the keys to the cabinet. I just talk about them. Right. That's another guy at PDMA that, that has the keys. So let's. Okay, we've we've talked about quality control uh, case study. We've talked about trending. Let's go into the most exciting of the day: troubleshooting. Right. This is where you know rubber meets the road. Your training gets put in place, and we go celebrate afterwards, even though we just cost the company a lot of money by not finding it early. Right. So don't get too excited about about it. But I get excited myself as well. So it's good stuff. All right. Put yourself in this situation. You've just had your third drive failure on an application. Maybe we should look at something else, right? If, it's, if the drive is failing three times, I think it was three, maybe it's four, okay? Either way, that's a lot of failures, right? We probably ought to look for a different, what we call root cause failure analysis. You guys have all been through that training, I know. But it's something that's very important. Whew, I gotta hustle a little bit here. Oh, I was wrong. Four variable frequency drives within three years. Someone's gonna start asking questions, aren't they? And you're going to apply this new language and communication protocol for electric motors and drives, right? The fault zone analysis. Either way, all these, and, and even then, the, even though they're not failing, there's a bunch of nuisance trips going on at the same time, right? So imagine you're the guy that's in charge of this troubleshooting effort. What are you going to do? Well, uh, there's, uh, and there's a funny commercial that, that they're talking about what to do with the, a new expansion of an uh, industry, and they always say, well, let's just call this other company. <laughs> you could do that. You could, if, if you don't have the expertise in-house, contact, you know, a service center that has a technology to bring in and trouble, help you troubleshoot. But either way, they're, they're going after this. They're going to try to figure out what the root cause is. And the first thing they do is try to do some testing. Now, this testing is at the starter. So they remove the drive, and they test from the drive to the motor, right? Divide and conquer. So it's a, actually a very good approach. I always give the mechanics a hard time. It, there was a rule back in the day when I was on the, on the submarine. And it was basically that if there was an electrical, if there was a problem with a system, and there was an electrical cable within 15 feet of that system, problem was electrical. You guys ever heard that rule? It's 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 universal, right? Now, in defense of the mechanics that I worked with, when they had to troubleshoot, it was taking stuff apart, right? When when we got to troubleshoot, we got to bring in electronics and tools and and measure stuff, and and so it was. I can understand that to some extent. Like that's, let's clear the electrical first. But still aggravating when you're trying to get some sleep, right? But that's the way it was. So in this situation, uh, we're, we're, we have to disconnect the drive often to do testing of the motor. Because there's always, there's a lot of times there's parallel paths within the drive that can cause influence on the readings. And we don't want to influence the readings falsely. So in this situation, the first test I'm going to point out here is 145 megs on a recently refurbished motor. Now refurbished probably means cleaned, new bearings maybe, sent back, right? Who here wants a motor recently refurbished at 145 meg? You shouldn't, right? The IEEE standard says you, should, you can continue to operate this motor as long as it's over 100 meg. That's pretty good, right? If it's, a, if it's a random wound, it can go down to 5 meg. But this is a recently refurbished motor, which is sometimes you've got to apply logic to what you're testing, right? If this is a recently refurbished motor, we want megs and gigs, not, not 145. We want thousands and thousands, right? So it's an issue that needs to be brought up. But everything else looks pretty good. Again, why do I know that? Because there's no red. And red is, all right, another challenge. Red numbers change. And what I mean by that is, if I take you back 20 years ago, PDMA established standards and, and things for you to base your health on based on the industry knowledge at the time. Guess what's changed? Industry knowledge and manufacturing. Motors aren't made the same as they were before. Insulation is different. Rotor design is different. Every year, challenge your reliability team to do a caution and alarm review. It doesn't take that long. And guess who they can lean on? They don't have to be, I realize there's other things that you guys do besides motor testing, right? Lean on the vendors. Call them and say, hey, I want to review my standards, my, 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 my caution and alarm values. They're happy to do that. And they'll share with you new standards that have come to light. And here's the thing. And we're probably not the only ones that do this. We send out new software that updates your standards, that updates your, your alarm set points. But guess what we will not do? We will not go to your existing motors and change anything. Because who knows, you may have your own selective caution alarm levels that are unique to your plant. We will not change your existing assets. New assets being added, get the new standards. So what you're going to have to do in terms of your caution alarms is review those every once in a while, make sure that you, know, you can do templates, build templates for certain types or designs of motors, find them, and move them all at once to the new alarm set points. These are, this is important no matter what technology you're looking at. Review the standards, make sure that you're up to, up to date. So, 
Everything else here is good. Let's look and see what's next. An insulation test. It's like a mega, only it's longer. We call it a polarization index test. And it actually is a much better look at insulation, and there's a lot of standards you can look at to see what's normal and what's not. The bottom line is this is not what we want to see. That type of, of, of fluctuation in erratic values down around 3 to 400 meg, right? At 60 seconds, that one test had us down around 145. After 10 minutes, we're up to 400, so it's getting better, but it's not steady like we like to see. The, the shop involved in troubleshooting this said, hey, we think there's moisture in the conduit. Anybody ever had moisture in the conduit? Sometimes you wonder if it was built in there. Right? How does it even get in there sometimes? Moisture finds a way, right? So remember I said isolate, divide, and conquer? Now they separated the cables from the motor, and they're testing the motor only. I've always thought that of the six fault zones that we created, I wish I came up with another fault zone, which was not the motor. Right? Sometimes it's not the motor. Right? A lot of times it's not the motor. And in this situation, now we've got measured 3,400 meg, 3.4 gigohms on the motor by itself. I'm a little more happy with that. I might be more willing to push the start button on that. I won't even make the new guy start the motor, right? But now we're focusing on the cable runs, aren't we? That kind of falls in line with maybe water in the conduit, right? The cables may be contaminated. PI on the motor only, eh, not perfect, but look what we're up to. Now we're up to 13, 14,000 meg. I'm, pretty, I'm feeling pretty good about the motor, okay? I don't necessarily like this stuff, but you know, I'm feeling pretty good about it, right? Now, here's the bad part. They looked at the conduit, opened it up, waiting for the water to gush out. No water, right? Another one of those wah, wah, wah. All the excitement goes away like, damn, I thought for sure we were going to find water. They didn't. But they wanted to replace some cables because there were some bad indications on some of the cables. And guess what they found in the process of replacing the cables? Where was the water? Not in the conduit, actually in the insulation system itself, OK? drawn into the insulation, setting on the copper wires, that's a big find, right? It's a big deal. So root cause, moisture, they need to probably find the, root the source of that. But let's get, they replaced the cables, and guess what? Cables and motor together now are reading 1,500 corrected, 1,700 measured. That's a much better combination. Remember, your insulation resistance is the lower than the lowest reading. So if you have 100 megs and you have 1 megs, your total resistance to ground reading is going to be less than 1 meg. OK, the weakest link is what makes the difference, right? So when it comes to ground wall insulation. So that was a very good find. Now, guess what? No nuisance trips. Somebody deserves a pat on the back, except for they just replaced four drives without doing the root cause failure analysis, right? But still a good catch. No more failures, no more nuisance trips, all because of water. So the next time you have an issue with a motor drive combination, and you call the drive and say, hey, this is going on, and they tell you, go check the motor insulation. You'll be like, why are they telling me to check the motor insulation when I think it's a drive problem? Well, now you know why. Because motor insulation will absolutely throw a drive crazy. If you start changing the ground reference, the neutral reference, the drive starts to you know, not figure out when it needs to fire, it can be very problematic. So don't be surprised when you're asked to look at that drive. Now, remember I had six fault zones? I changed this up. So the guys that were with us on Tuesday, I modified this a little bit, and I got about five minutes. Remember I said it, I, I thought we should have a fault zone that's called not the motor? This is an electrical reliability okay, uh, conference or, or, or discussion, right? So often your testing, okay, even following the 15-foot rule of motor troubleshooting, right, is going to find that it's not the motor. Okay? What can we share with you in your troubleshooting to be aware of? And it's machine train. There's a lot of machine train stuff that actually can be indicated and identified through electrical testing. Specifically in this situation, a gearbox. Okay, and in the time allotted, I don't want to take too much time here, but some of you guys have probably modified versions of cooling towers, right? And maybe not this big. This is a, a fairly large uh, motor, uh, but nonetheless, it's, it's th that's the kind of cooling tower we're talking about. This is a, a 480 volt, low voltage. Two, it's a four pole motor, which is a little better for analysis. It's a 200 horsepower, and there's a knocking noise, a knock, 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 knock. It probably didn't come by the manufacturer, so you figure something's going on, right? So looking into this, what they identified using current signature analysis, again, looking at the spectrum peaks, is that back in October of 2015, again, doing a historical ass assessment, remember trend is your friend? Without history, this is a lot harder. Trust me. Try to get some data. The output gear speed is about 112 RPM. Does that show up in your electrical testing? Well, it changes torque. And if it changes torque, then it changes your, your, your current, OK, even at a small level, right? We can look at the values are way down into the 0.1 range. 
back in, in 2015. In October, our sideband, remember we were talking about that, that sideband pole pass? Okay, now we're looking at about, you know, down by the blue line. No, not abnormal, really, nothing to, to shake a stick at, really. But from 2016 to, to 2018, the motor was collected, no issues found. Again, trend is your friend, right? But here comes 2018, and now we've got some issues. Uh, all kinds of peaks coming out of nowhere. We call those harmonics, right? And, and with those harmonics, they mean something, all right? And, and, and so it's, it's, it's time to look into some things, right? It's very important at this point to start figuring out what's going on. The sideband, eh, we're not seeing much here, that, you know, initially, but in 18, out the roof. Sometimes too good to be true. You're like, man, do we call rotor bars here? Remember, you're going to remember next time someone wants to call rotor bars, Noah Bethel went to the utility plant East Coast and got totally fooled by machine train indications. All right? Don't be that. Don't throw the motor in for replacement only to get another motor in showing you the same thing. Right? That happens way too much. Harmonics of the gear. So we've got machine train frequencies that your, you know, again, at some point, your, your analyst, your electrical analyst may work with your vibration group and say, hey, what kind of frequencies do we have on this? The vibration guys will know. And then you'll build band alarms around these and make sure that you're tracking them, right? Working together with the other technologies. So in this situation, they, they all, a, a real popular uh, waterfall plot kind of shows the growth. Even though I don't like the angle of this, they really should angle it a little bit more. The bottom line is from early to late, the, am the amplitudes are just going up, right? So we see all kinds. You can zoom in on that, and they, and they should have done a better job on that, on, that, on that slide. I didn't have a better look at that. I apologize. But 3D is very exciting. It was enough to get into the gears and take a look. What a great catch, right? Catch this early. Make sure that the gear is getting attention. Vibration group should see this as well. Yes. You know, but it's always nice to have somebody else saying there's something going on, all right? And they got to, they're just as busy as the electrical guys, okay? So they may not be looking at this as often. This can happen pretty quick. So another, just a great machine train, which kind of leads us right up to lunch, which is good. Um, so we've talked about a lot of things in that very short period of time, a lot of high-level stuff, okay, in terms of the quality control training and troubleshooting. Don't forget that, okay? So often people are using technology they spend money on, and they're just doing troubleshooting. There's so much more to your reliability technology, okay? I can't emphasize enough about quality control. Don't be surprised if 5 to 10% of the motors that you have in a nice warehouse or that you don't have in a nice warehouse are not really as quality as you think, okay? Now, I know you don't have time to just throw people in there for months, right? But the next time you take one of those motors out of that warehouse, make sure you're on it with whatever technology you have. Get on it, make sure before you spend man hours to install it that it's taken care of and it's, good, it's a good motor. Um, trending is, is easy. Trend is your friend. I say that a lot. It's, you're going to remember that. But, but get the guys on a, on a routine as much as possible. Routes, try to keep them. Uh, get, get three readings, if at all possible. Right? Uh, I, I didn't cover much on the inrush, but the inrush startup, is, is, is I can tell you, if you can get one test from a motor, that's it. You know, when you know a new motor is going in, send somebody out there with the ability to capture power, voltage, and current through that startup. That is the single most best piece of information for any future troubleshooting, okay? Because during startup, your motor goes through the most stress it'll ever go through. Drives help that. They reduce the, volt, the, the current through a, a control voltage start. That's the most stressful time of a motor's existence is in rush and startup. Capture that once. You have that as an amazing baseline to compare it to whatever else have. Should be critical. New motors going in. Flags go up. You know, the bat phone's on. Hey, well, I need people on site. Don't start that motor without us. And remember, if you don't have that type of quality control, you let who start the motor? The new guy's got to start the motor, right? Make sure you got that covered. So quality control training and troubleshooting. Challenge your reliability group to have a good troubleshooting procedure, okay? An, an action list. What do you do next if this happens? What do you test? Who do you call? This kind of thing. Uh, you know, casual procedure is really important. And then remember that fault zone protocol, power quality, power circuit, insulation, state, or rotor. Next time someone comes in with a mega reading saying, it's not the motor, you say, well, what about the power quality? You know, what did you do to look at power quality? What can we do to look at power quality? What about the stator? You know, what about the insulation of ground? Are you just testing ground, or are you also testing inner stator? Uh, Rudy mentioned the, the five senses, nose. We used to really enjoy when someone would call and say, hey, the motor started three times, and every time it meggers fine. And we'd say, well, what does it smell like? You'd be surprised how many people don't know what the motor smells like, right? Go out, and, and you, you go out there, and you find out that smoke's coming out of the thing, right? Because it's burning up turn to turn, but it's not showing a ground yet. And every time they push that start button, they're doing more and more damage. Eventually, it will damage the iron, doubles the cost of repair if they damage enough. 